seven days a week already and we're only providing a small group of people at this point. But, but yeah, lots going in the ground, trying to coordinate everything so that we've got a box for each CSA member of 10 to 12 different varieties of vegetables. Things like radishes, lettuce, the brassicas are in, the cabbages are in, carrots and beetroots are on rotation all the time, Brussels sprouts, fennel, stuff like that. I think there's about 15 different varieties in the ground already. Peas are in, I built a pea wall. Newbies like myself, we get excited and we want to grow everything. And then we realise after a year or two that it's best to sort of streamline that down to maybe a total of 15 different varieties, but do those 15 really, really well. There's a balance between having a healthy variety of produce and too much. So you can't give the quality that you're after because you're trying to manage too many different nuances of all these different varieties of vegetables. Some need, you know, they're heavy feeders, some are light feeders. Some are more susceptible to certain diseases, some are root crops, some are you know, growing out above ground. They're all affected by different things and they react differently to, to what I'm doing as well. There's a lot of uh, variations of CSA, so you can interpret it a number of ways, but it's a little bit like a, you know, having a group of shareholders, I suppose. So, like crowdfunding, you start a CSA, you say, all right, in four months' time, guys, my membership, we're going to have this wonderful produce. It's going to cost you, you know, for five weeks, it'll cost you $300 now each. You know, they invest. In many cases, you also share the risk. So, if the tomatoes get diseased that year and there's no tomatoes, then that's at the CSA membership's cost as well. There's an element of goodwill that I'm trying to create here as well. I mean, I'm lucky because I've got other income. You know, my photography and so on is still you know, ticking away in the background. So I thought, let's not say we'll share the risk. And if the tomatoes get diseased, there'll be something else. Yeah, I'll go to Woolies and buy some. <laughs>
thing about them that carries forward memories. A lot of the plants that I value the most may not be particularly extraordinary plants, but I love them because they may have come from Granny or they may have been something that I um, connected with in my grandmother's garden or my great uncle's garden or that my dad always had in his shade house growing up. Or um, There's that, that connection of heritage from generation to generation. There's something really peaceful and abundant and satisfying about that. Every house that I've lived in has ended up having a garden spilling out of it or over a balcony of it. I've just found that no matter where I go, plants tend to proliferate. We built this place knowing that we were going to build a shed house. My only requirements were that I wanted somewhere that had good light and great water. Quite a few plants came inside from the start and then a few more and, and a few more and, and a couple more until it turned into a jungle. <laughs> I'm sure it's no surprise that when I decide to get into animals, I choose leaf and stick insects. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it fits with my brand. I just saw them and thought they'd make a really, really cool pet. I'm fascinated by them. I mean, how could you not be? Look at that. Yeah, give them the Go on. Show them beautiful wings. Their only form of defence is the fact that they can make themselves look invisible in nature. They don't bite, they don't poison, they don't sting, they don't do anything. They just hang out and eat leaves and lay eggs. Excuse me, miss. I don't want to go into too high because I don't like it when she falls. Um, what's happening? <laughs> This is a goliath. This, the other one on the corn cob is the spiny leaf insect. The other green stick is a strong stick insect and we've got the crown lichens, which was the black and grey. And it's quite lovely whenever it's a bit of a windy day and a breeze comes through and then the whole cage will just go <laughs> you know, as a family, we don't need a lot, and we've got to points where there's been absolutely zero money. Um, we've had zero debt, which was good. But I remember one point many years ago, a friend had to go and catch a, a fish for us, a nice big fish that provided 13 meat meals in the freezer. And we're okay with that, we can live like that. So when COVID came along, we were all right, okay, we've been here many times, let's just batten down the hatches and there's no unnecessary spending. I've got a good dive buddy and we go out and we, uh, you know, maybe once or twice a, a fortnight we'll go out and have a dive and get a, a bit of fish for the freezer and our family eats that. We both grew up here diving with our, our parents, they used to dive together, our dads. We grew up using that resource for food. When you're in the water here, it's, it's remarkable. Beautiful caves, the corals, big plate corals. The fish, if you get to somewhere further out where they haven't seen humans, they're just like inquisitive little dogs, you know, puppies following you around. You can hand feed groper, with a big green, blue groper.
I, he was off in the distance, he's like, Ooh, and I turned around, he's like, this thing's nearly going through his throat, <laughs> trying to stuff it in the back. And I was like, oh shit, it had all these, it fully had me. Had his whole hockey system wrapped up, it was pulling him. Beautiful abalone as well. There's not much that comes from the ocean that you can't eat. You know, I don't like killing animals, but I do eat meat, so I'm happy to take a few fish to provide for the family. And that's motivated me to grow vegetables to go with that fish. Vegetables are just beautiful plants. There's so many different ones of them and you can eat them like they make food. We always grew more than we could use ourselves. When we moved to Esperance, it became very clear to me how vulnerable you are from a fresh food point of view because we're eight hours drive from the city and most of the fresh food comes in on a truck, is not grown here, is not grown near here. Esperance does agriculture, but it's broad acre. It's wheat and sheep, and it's not lettuces and carrots and beetroots and that sort of thing. And especially in light of, um, you know, the COVID situation, it didn't take long for all of the supermarket shelves to empty out. And so the idea of being able to grow vegetables on a larger scale, I think is really important. The highest amount of nutrition that's going to be in a vegetable or fruit is when it's first picked, which is why local vegetables are so important. You know, with Mistwood, we have the opportunity to be able to ensure that when people get their vegetables, it's been touched by one pair of hands before it's delivered to your door. When we bought Mistwood, we sort of thought, well, maybe we'll, you know, grow some more vegetables and we'll put in an orchard and maybe we'll do some cut wildflowers and actually making a little bit of a business of it. But the COVID situation just fast-tracked it. But we've gone from being garden lovers and people that like to grow their own vegetables to bang, bang we're now market gardeners. Ta-da! Um, that's, that's, that's been a pretty quick step. You know, as I've gotten older and had children myself, I've realised how important community is, and I think that's the reason that I still live in Esperance. I came back, what, 16, 17 years ago. For two years, I thought I'd see the family and just you know, swing by. Uh, from Melbourne, I was living in Melbourne, and um, I'm still here. There's pros and cons with uh, having a, a strong community um, environment. And one is that, you know, the con is of course that, you know, you can't do anything without everybody knowing about it. Uh, but at the same time, you walk down the street and you could just get caught talking for hours. You go for a run along the beach and you wave to everyone. Even driving out of here, if I pass a car, there's the big wave. No, 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 it's just something really wonderful about it. You feel like you're part of an extended family. It's been really humbling for us because we didn't realise how many people would be fully supporting it and there's just such a great feel good vibe about the whole thing. One of our members said I've made payment for mine but I've also made payment for a whole other membership. You know basically just paid it forward. Just If there's someone in your group of members that really needs a bit of a boost, needs a hug, needs, a, needs something good to happen to them, I want you to pass it on and apply it to that family. Um, and I, 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 I had tears. But that's the culture of our membership. That's the kind of people that are drawn to this idea. And that's really beautiful. We're very lucky to have the members that we do. Um, and we're really excited to see how that membership can grow. And we're really excited to be able to grow beautiful vegetables for all these beautiful people. We don't need a lot. We're quite happy um, wearing very hats full of character and just seeing how long you can wear that before that falls off. You know, we don't need to, our image isn't as, as important to us as it might have been many years ago when we are living in a different environment. One of the things I love about living here is that nobody judges you for that, which is great. You know, country life, it's fantastic.